Um, I'm what you call them today, maybe they are uh, running for high office. Uh, Good evening, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee meeting. First thing, first uh, order of business will be the adoption of the agenda for the meeting. Have a motion? Second. You make a motion or second? <laughs> you make the motion. I'll make the motion. Somebody make a motion. I'll Somebody <laughs> second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, yeah, Tom. Page three. We're doing. I, what, what, we're adopting the agenda first. You said discussion. I yes. that oh, I'm sorry. The agenda. I thought we, you, agenda minutes. first. Then we go to meeting. I'm sorry. I thought it was two minutes. I'm sorry. Never forget, Tom. Mm -hmm. I approved. That on my list now. <laughs> All those in favor of the agenda, say aye. 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 Eyes have it. Approval of the minutes. Aye. Okay, Tom. All right, just on page three, uh, item. Uh, five should that um, it says capital improvement plan as opposed to the plan 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 yep the only and the other addition to corrections With that correction when I make a recommendation to approve the minutes second <coughs> that's correct second all those in favor aye 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 <coughs> Fiscal year 15 through 19 CIP introduction. Dina. Thank you. And thank you for having me this evening. Um, so I think most of you should have a copy of the proposed um, capital improvement plan that we have um, distributed last Friday in your packets. And so I just want to kind of go over a little bit of the objectives for this evening. This year is a little bit different. Um, what you have received in your packet is a true preliminary draft CIP or the <coughs> capital improvement plan. This CIP is um, one where staff has identified projects that are e either previously identified in a prior CIP and or new projects that we wish to start developing and doing some investigative work within the next five years. So today we're going to go over, uh, kind of recap what the capital improvement plan process entails and how to read the sheets that you have. Tonight's focus is going to be primarily on the FY15 and 16 projects. We'll talk about a little bit about the future projects and kind of why you see some of those um, more as a, with no dollars associated with them or no, no um, expenditures or, or revenue sources identified. And then we're going to talk about kind of the next steps of where we, we see us going over the next month and a half or so. 
So that being said, we're going to um, kind of recap again what is a capital improvement plan. These are major non reincurring investments in physical infrastructure and facilities. They have to be greater than $50,000 and have a, a useful life of more than 12 months. Or, I'm sorry, the project time is more than 12 months with a useful life of more than five years. And our capital improvement plan, we focus on streets, sidewalks, <coughs> water and sewer, lines, pump stations, lift stations, um, and uh, things of that nature. Again, the CIP is our five-year planning window. And if you look at it, we've got in year one, we're focusing on those projects that we actually have money to construct or start doing planning processes. And year one is the whatever the current budget fiscal year is. So this one, it's CI, it's a CIP 15 through 19. So 15 is our next fiscal year that starts July 1. So any money that's been programmed for next year are the projects that we actually foresee us actually starting either design or, and or construction. The CIP discloses possible expenditures and um, sources of financing. It also helps us evaluate, prioritize, and schedules our projects. This kind of gives us a working plan for all departments to see where our big investments are going. And it also identifies any potential impacts on, pro on our operating budget. So if we've got, um, for instance, hypothetically, if we had a pump station coming online and we needed more personnel, we would identify that in the CIP. So again, here's, this is some um, snapshots from last year. These are, not, these are just carryover slides. But what you see circled as the planning window, that's our five-year window. And so this, in, this year is the year that we call the build year. That's the year that we actually have money to go forward on the projects. These years that we have here, the last three years, we look at those more as placeholders or planning opportunities. The project might come in and that fifth year, and at that moment it's a concept. And, um, and as it start moves closer towards the year one or the build year, those are when the, the scopes get re, um, redefined. We, have, we might start off with a very large project and through some investigative work, we've realized that we're coming down instead of maybe doing um, a thousand linear feet, we're only doing 500, repla you know, 500 feet of replacement or we decide to go from a full replacement to maybe a lining project. So um, those last three years are really, really just planning placeholders and we refine the scope as we get closer to the build year. <clears throat> so this, the entire area up top here is the expenditure estimates. So in this particular project, just to kind of help you see how to read it, We've identified that in prior years, meaning any fiscal year beyond the build year, we have, we have either spent roughly 126000 on this sample project. In the build year, we think or anticipate that we were going to spend 614000 in these particular areas between engineering, <coughs> construction, and construction administration. And again, these are estimates. We don't necessarily, we might not have an actual contract with real dollars. This is kind of a financing schedule of when we think we're going to spend something. In this particular project with the INI, it's an ongoing project. So in other projects, we might end in 14 or 15, but in this one is an ongoing one. And so we envision in year 15, hypothetically in this project, that we're using 70,000 for design. And you see the pattern where we have design one year, construction the next, design, et cetera. So this kind of helps us forecast expenditures, and then with that, it allows our financing department to look at probable financing. So in this particular case, they've identified that they need to, the sewer fund, which is the funding source for this project, would fund the project for the design and construction on a, um, every two years. But it, again, it depends on the type of project, depends on the funding source. So it's a joint effort between um, all the departments to include financing to see um, what our possible funding sources might be. We also would try to identify what a priority is. And, at the, and, and they had some um, high, medium, and low. I think most of them are medium and high, but um, there are some low priorities. But in this case, what's doing with infrastructure, they tend to be medium and high. We also allows us the opportunity to identify some other important characteristics of this project. It helps um, at a staff level and at a council level to identify is it part of a master plan 
Is it externally mandated? Is the state making us withdraw from a certain aquifer that we have to do this project? Is it growth related, service related? And then also what kind of, what type of project is this? Is it a new project? Is it an improvement? Um, sometimes when you look at the name of a project, you might not have a good understanding of what exactly it might entail. And these characteristics um, allow us to give it some greater definition. And what we just talked about, it kind of shows you here where you can find um, the type is located up top on the right and towards the middle under the project name are the other characteristics where um, the master plan mandated growth and service related. In addition, it allows us to further break out um, the types of category um, and it allows us to, to divide out our actual entire capital improvement plan. What you've gotten um, to review prior to our meeting this evening is just water and sewer. But as I said before, we have um, um, water and sewer, we've got general fund, we've got streets reclamation and transit. So the CIP is a much larger end product than just what you've got before you this evening. And again, it's more um, opportunities to define the project as you see on the screen. So again, that was kind of a brief overview of how to kind of read the, the, the sheets that you have. And I know we've, we've talked about this every year. Um, and so these are the projects that we are looking at that are, are new <coughs> or ongoing. So the projects you see in front of you um, for FY15 that we've identified as a new project coming in for this next fiscal year <coughs> is the FY15 water line replacement. And we're gonna talk about these projects here in just a minute. And then the FY16 projects, um, we've identified two new projects. And I stated at the very beginning of the, of the presentation, this is a very preliminary um, list of projects. So much so that this past week, we had some discussions with staff and the project that we've identified as the water well level transducers, this project has since been deleted from the proposed CIP. We have, staff has identified that this project is something that we can incorporate into an existing CIP project. And as such, we've deleted, as, deleted it as a standalone project. So again, this is another unique opportunity because you guys are in, in the throes and you're working with us as we go through this draft CIP. So we're gonna focus now on um, some of the, the larger projects that might be new. And by new, I mean that we are either finishing up design or we're starting design and or construction over the next couple of um, this fiscal year and next fiscal year. So you're gonna have a lot of pretty pictures to look at. So if you turn to your, uh, we're gonna be talking about um, the Parkwood Regional Lift Station, Force Main and Western Trunk Sewer. If you turn to page two and three in your packet, those are the two projects that we'll be talking about. I know we've talked about these projects in great detail, especially <coughs> last meeting, so we won't go into too much detail. But just to refresh everyone's mind, we're building a pump station, the new, a new Parkwood pump station in this area, and where the project entails the force main, or the, the trunk sewer here, and the force main all the way to the land app. That's what this project entails. As we talked about last, last month, that um, the overall project has slipped a little bit as a result of trying to acquire easements. So the project slipped a little bit, and as a result, it was also increased in price about $2 million. And these are just budget numbers at the moment. We haven't designed anything. It's just based on um, similar, like per linear foot cost of project and prior pump stations of similar sizes. So again, this isn't real nuts and bolts design. And if you guys have any questions as I go through this, please stop me and we why, can. Why did it slip? Um, Greg, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> um, well, we, it has to do with trying to acquire easements for the force main. Um, we, our preferred route was through Barton Park. Uh, the county uh, in, in a specific location. And the county preferred that we not go through that specific location. They suggested an alternate location. Did they give a reason why they didn't want us to go through? Um, they weren't, I guess what I would say is they weren't uh, sure how the park was going to develop in that area, so they didn't want to uh, tie that land up with a force main. And so they suggested an alternate route that was going to cost, uh, it's going to, it would cost uh, even more than the additional $2 million that we're talking about right now. 
we identified an alternate route and we're pursuing that right now. We've got to see if we can make that work. So that's why it slipped. Is that route also somewhere near Burton Park? Uh, it's south of Burton Park. Is it who owns the land? Uh, I quite honestly, I don't know the name of the individuals. What it is, it is a road right of way that is under the ownership of, uh, I think, a family. Um, I think it's, it's not owned by the county. No, it's not owned by the county. No. The, the part that's outlined it goes across, and you have that big <coughs> drop and then jag. Why is it doing that instead of going straight across? So right mm -hmm. In this it's area, like it's following yeah. the mm -hmm. existing line. It's, fo it's following. Mm -hmm. uh, it is following. Uh, Hooking into the other line. No, just going parallel, I imagine. No, no the no, other line uh, comes up from the south, if you will. We're coming in from the north side. What happens is, what it's doing is it's following a road, and there's a sharp bend in that road, and then it takes off sort of through the countryside, uh, through what I will call a rural area, where there's also another uh, <coughs> privately owned right-of-way uh, established, and then we pop out on another parcel just across from the, the little station. And that, I think we've probably refined it a little bit better since that, that particular mm -hmm. graphic was developed. But um, That looks like the curve of Pony Farm Road. It is the curve of Pony Farm Road. Yeah. That's all I got. Good. Thank you. Um, the next project is the Brookview Force Main, and that's on page seven. <coughs> This project, when we initially um, started through the design process, is to replace approximately 1,300 linear feet of aerial force main from the Burkeview pump station to Maple Street. <coughs> through the, the initial design process, we had identified actually installing, rather than replacing what's there, of installing a, uh, a new line doing directional drill. We had designed the project and we ran into um, some delays as a result of trying to qu acquire an easement. Um, which has actually, uh, we've since taken another look at the project and have decided to pursue the possibility of replacing or rehabbing the existing aerial force main. We have um, contacted some structural engineers and done some structural analysis and assessment and we are pursuing that possible option now. The project that is proposed in the CIP remains unchanged, so the, the numbers that you see there for Brookview Force Main has a total project budget of about $800,000. If we continue with the directional drill, that price is estimated to go up another $200,000 because there's additional requirements that we have since learned that we would have to do to meet CAMA requirements. If we were able to continue with the rehabilitation of the existing line, then we anticipate that pr the project being reduced to about $400,000. So we see some, some extreme benefit in pursuing that alternative design method, and staff is reviewing that now. So the project is going to remain unchanged, as you see, until we have actually make a decision on which route we're going to go. They're going to rehab what's there? Yeah, the, we found that the pipe itself, other than a, just a small area, the pipe is in good condition. The pilings are, is what we need to take a look at um, and the pilings other than just being right at the creeks water that is the only they're in good shape so we're actually looking at the possibility of wrapping the pilings and then coming back and just replacing that small section of pipe but we before we go down that path we need to do a better assessment of the the pipe <coughs> strength and in, in, um, the what is it the um, <coughs> the strength and the thickness, the wall thickness. So basically you're going to see if the pipe's strong enough to take more pressure and more water. <clears throat> well, what, what we've basically done... Basically it? We, yes, in a nutshell. Uh, we're, we've uh, sampled the pipe uh, all along the force main, and what we found on average, the pipe has lost maybe about 6% <coughs> of its thickness, and uh, which is not so bad. And there is a one place that we found where it's lost about 25% of its thickness. And so we've got to do some calculations mm -hmm. to see, do we really need to replace this section? If not, how long will it last? And then all the piles uh, need to be wrapped from just below the mud line to at least about, I think, 
18 inches or so above the mud line, and we'll probably carry them up to the support structure. And when we do that, what our initial indications are is that we will extend the life of this installation by about 20 years. So, just out of curiosity, what are you wrapping with? It's called fiber wrap. It's uh, it's a um, fiber impreg impregnated resin, polymer resin. Just uh, strengthens it. Uh, it strengthens it a little bit. But there's two types. One is just a protective wrap, mm -hmm. and one is a structural injection wrap. Mm -hmm. What we'll probably do is the structural injection wrap near the two water courses that run through the swamp, and then the other ones we'll just do the uh, wrap to protect it from the elements. Okay. The other things we have to do is we found a number of uh, carpenter ant holes in the pile, so we've got to repair all those. Some of the stainless steel supports, stainless steel, uh, nonetheless, uh, some rust. What we've got to do is uh, remove some of that, and then we're going to gel coat the uh, uh, stainless steel. And again, it's, uh, it's we're right now, <coughs> we're thinking if we go this route, something on the order of $400,000 versus, you know, an $800,000 project. Question, uh, you had been going to replace it, the 16 with the 24, because you thought it wasn't going to be a large enough capacity. <coughs> that, when the project first started, we weren't sure that the project you saw earlier, Parkwood Regional Pump Station, mm -hmm. was going to happen. And our old master plan basically said, if you don't, it didn't even envision Parkwood. And it envisioned everything, all the sewer from expanding city being routed right through our existing infrastructure. And so planning for the future, what we needed to do was upsize that pipe. Now that we're pursuing Parkwood, if you remember what I said last time, it's sort of like an interstate system. It's gonna take all the new development sewer and some of the existing sewer and route it around the you know the old stuff so that we really don't have to expand the old stuff, make the old stuff bigger to accommodate all the new development. Would it still let you, for lack of a better word, slosh it back and forth like you were thinking that you might have to be able to do? Mm, that's still up in the air. Yeah, that's, that that's is still, up still up a little bit yeah. up in the air, but um, <coughs> yeah, I don't think this particular segment was part of it. I, I don't, yeah, I think Henderson. Yeah, it went from Henderson, Henderson to the main pump station and from here to Henderson, I believe. Yeah. Okay. They couldn't get a better working So, any concerns with the couplers that were put on it last year for, you know, to hold them together? Any that actually concerns? made a, a big difference. Yeah, I was going to ask that that, that worked That's, pretty good. It stopped yeah. moving. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it yeah. basically made it almost like a single, single piece span the water and tied back to the banks such that it was stabilized. So now what we're doing with this pause. And that was part of the work that Pete's crews did, is right. they actually tied it into the bank with a concrete structure mm -hmm. and rotted it back to the bank. The next project is our Barn Street sewer replacement, and that's on page 8. This project is um, one that we're under design at the moment, and it is um, as a result of a manhole that was surcharging and overflowing, which is in this area right here. And we have since learned that we believe the reason why it was doing that was the entire area that's, that's highlighted in red is undersized to meet the demand flows that come off of Henderson, and Henderson is this road right here. That's Henderson. So we've got, um, knowing that we have, there's um, some possible I&I &I in this area as well, this, is the, this Henderson sewer basin is one that's been identified for our, um, the lining project that we currently have underway. So we're lining the area and we're upsizing um, the section that you see in red that we will, um, are hopeful and pretty confident that that manhole will, won't surcharge and overflow anymore. So we are finishing up design this year and construction for next year. So we're taking basically an eight inch and, and installing a 12 inch. The other thing I would say about that part of the problem too, even though it's an eight inch, is that eight inch is flat. So it's got almost no slope on it whatsoever. <coughs> Our next project is the Clea and Candu sewer and that's on page nine. 
and this project actually has been reduced than over what was in the CIP for last year. Last year we actually included um, Palm. Palm was going to be a project that we were um, had identified as a sewer replacement. And as we started going through the design process, we found out <coughs> that the sewer line wasn't the issue. The sewer line's in really good condition. It was access to the sewer line. So after speaking with um, Pete, we have removed that project from the CIP and Pete's gonna clear it um, through his annual contract. So um, as a result, this project has significantly reduced in cost. We've got, um, we also have um, these two projects that we're gonna be doing um, replacing. And I think we're going to be, um, yeah, the project is reduced from, it's, it's 145,000 now. I wanna say it was uh, for something last CIP. And again, it was the reason why it got was reduced so much was only because that we thought it was the sewer line and it wasn't. It was actually just access to it. Before we move on, can yep. we go back to the uh, Born Street sewer replacement just for a minute? Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little confused here. It says funding sources are going to be revenue bonds. Uh, and then down below it shows the debt service. Is that already been let those revenue bonds and that's why we have that projected out like that or is that the debt <clears throat> service may not have been updated yet that that's updating that 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 <clears throat> service is one of the last things we yeah because the, the i wouldn't even look at the debt service don't look at the no. debt service at the bottom so it's just strictly the yes. two above yes and that would be new de uh debt that's seven hundred seventy three thousand. uh i would think so i think that's going to come from when they do the next release Okay. Because that project's so far out. They can only go so far out before they can actually borrow money for that project. And I just thought that was 2015. <clears throat> but we didn't, I don't think we borrowed the money for that project. Okay. Our last, <coughs> our last project was in 12, I think. It's been a while. So my question again was, the intention is this. to borrow that in the 2015 time yeah. period. We have um, Western Trunk Sewer Phase 2. It's on page 10. And this, this project is a continuation of the Parkwood Regional <coughs> Lift Station and the Western Trunk Sewer Phase 1. This will, um, will actually give us uh, a trunk sewer or a trunk sewer pump station combination along Western from Carolina Forest to, to Marine Boulevard. And once it's constructed, it will serve the area north of Western Boulevard. So um, this right now is programmed for design in 16, but this could be pushed out as a result of the phase one project. That's going to be constructed first, and then we can construct this one. So there's a possibility that this might shift out some. We have the FY16 sewer replacement, which is Ronnie Court, and that's on page 11. We have um, looked at this project and the price has come down. We um, are envisioning starting design in 16. This project was going to be a replacement and we have done some additional analysis and now we're going to use um, point repairs and cured in place lining. There is a um, extreme possibility that this project will be eliminated from the CIP and just encompassed in our existing INI project. Because we've changed the construction methods, the project estimate has decreased about $81,000 to use cured in place rather than um, full replacement. Moving on to page 15, we have Park Lane and Stratford Road water and sewer replacement. This is a design in 15, so we actually haven't started this project. So the numbers that you see uh, um, as a rough budget of 1.4 is based on a per linear foot cost because we haven't done any analysis. We um, envision replacing the water and sewer lines. The numbers that you see though are again based on a per linear foot cost. Some very preliminary evaluation that we did look at this that there, we have found that there are a lot of utilities within the existing road. So 
the numbers that you see are for, are for full replacement, but we are hoping that we can do a lining <coughs> instead. And if we can, the numbers will come down significantly than what you see currently budgeted. So probably next CIP discussion when we're talking about this project this time next year or sooner, you'll, we have a better understanding of kind of where we're at on this project. The FY14 water replacement project is on page 23. This project consists of various um, small diameter water lines basically on quartz and so we've, we've kind of um, lumped them together as one project. It's going to take <coughs> place in the Northwoods and the New River area. Again this will be um, we, um, we're, uh, we're under design now. Construction will start this next fiscal year. And the price on this project has increased a little bit as a result of some more in-depth analysis as we go through um, the design process as well. So this will probably bid, be bid out the first quarter or so of next fiscal year. This is a Greencrest Circle water replacement on page 24. And this is off of Richland Highway. This project is, is the replacement of approximately 1,800 linear feet of water line with it tentatively programmed for design and construction for next year. Um, this project does encompass this section as well. I inadvertently left that part out. Um, and um, this project has increased about 16,000 as a result, again, of more in-depth analysis but we haven't actually started the design process, so there's an opportunity that this might actually go down a little bit. Again. Yes. Could you say, I've noticed on a couple of these, when you're rehabbing the, the water lines, it says you're gonna replace the meters. It, um, it, I think it just depends it on the services. the services. Yeah, meter I mean, services. It might just be a, a typo or something. But it says replacement of all meters. meters. Right. No, the, the meters are the meters are current. Right. It's, it's probably just a typographical error. It's probably replacing the meter services. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. So that way, when you go in and do it, and you're going to resurface the road, and if we, if we don't replace the services, then we have to go back in there and, mm -hmm. and tear up new asphalt. It just mm -hmm. and it makes everybody look bad. So right. if you had to replace it all, all the way up to the meter, you're done, then resurface, and then theoretically you should not have to go back on that road and, and do any damage. Yeah, well, and thank you. We'll make that change. So as I, as I discussed when we first started speaking this evening, is what you're looking at is a very <coughs> preliminary CIP. We're still working through um, the 15 and 16 projects, and more importantly, we're, we're, we're looking at the future projects. And then the, few, the future projects, again, are years three, four, and five, or in this case, it's um, 17, 18, and 19, those, those three projects. So as you, in, you're looking through your packet, you'll see projects that um, are new project, and it says no need for their information. Those are the conversations that we're still having with staff. So the future projects, we're not prepared to go into any detail this evening <coughs> because we ourselves at a staff level haven't even um, really dived into the development of that rough scope and or budget. So um, the future pro projects again are identifying in those last three, four, and five build year or the three, four, and five planning years. The scopes are very broad that you haven't before you and the estimates are truly budgetary numbers and it goes back to that per linear foot cost that we based on our prior bid results. Um, and we're going to continue with some further discussions in um, fine tuning those. So what's going to happen next? Over the next month and a half, staff's going to continue refining the projects and the budgets. We're going to sit down with um, actual, um, we're sitting down with management next week to go through the entire CIP. There'll be additional changes and recommendations that we have to make. And our hope is that we can come back to you in January with a more final proposed CIP that we can present to you. Um, and then after that, the hope is that we can take it to council to present it in a, sim a similar fashion such as this this evening. Well, yeah, I've got a couple of observations <coughs> and I don't expect answers tonight. One is several of them didn't indicate funding source and I, I assume that will be clarified later. Yes. The other is I wonder 
which of these projects, because of the way you, you've got some are as committed to and some are high priority, but which of these projects are critical? Like the thing is about if we don't do it, we're going to have failure if we delay it a year or two. Because that comes into a question if uh, somebody wants to suggest that maybe we should put something in off for a reason. The other is, um, and I know you're going to tell me this is something we'll have to get to finance, but there's nothing that indicates how much of our revenue debt has been retired in 215 and how much we're taking on and if it's equal. So are we taking on excessively more debt every year, even though we're retiring some, hopefully, but we're going to be forcing our hand by having a CIP that's progressively more expensive because something starts in year one, and by year five, you've had four more years of revenue debt. And I'm assuming from what I, the conversation was that where it says revenue bonds finance for 20 years, since we haven't let the bonds, that's a guesstimate that we're hoping for, and not since we won't be able to tell if you've got something down here for a revenue bond that we haven't let yet. Well, and at this point, some of those may not even be financed that say they're going to be financed, because we do have fund balance that we can use, or it may be that we upfront cash for some of those, use fund balance, and then include those in a bond issue later. So those are all things that are going to be worked out over the next, and that'll probably take more than a month, but the next two months. But you can so. see the interest there because of the very yes. thing you're talking about. If we create three years down the road a money crunch where we've exceeded our, uh, we've taken on more and more debt and it exceeds what our revenues are and we haven't retired any, then rates are going to have to go up. Well, and you, know, you, you have to, to borrow a phrase from Mr. Massey, chicken and egg, mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere. So we start with the projects that we've identified a need for. G granted, the need may be higher on certain projects than on other projects, but then we take that need, refine the scopes of that, those projects, get a, <coughs> as, as well as we can a definitive cost. And then that's what goes into both our rate model and our <coughs> um, facility fee model. And it may be that, and there, there have been times when we've gotten to council, not as much on the water and sewer side, but on um, some of the general fund projects. And we've gotten all the way to, you know, the May, June timeframe and had to slip projects back because of the impact on um, either fees or taxes <coughs> or, or rates or something. So that, unfortunately, it's going to be an involving thing. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, if we had no money constraint, then it would only be a determination of what's critical. This is going to fail. We do this this year, it's cheaper than if we do it three years later, that type of thing. But if we're not retiring any debt in 215 and we're taking on more debt, then that could cause a problem. Then maybe we should suggest to you something that keeps that <coughs> And we, we wouldn't recommend those things if all things are, you know, the cash in and cash out. If you pay for everything with the water or sewer fund. And that's, <clears throat> at, at this point, the plan is to identify the needs, not necessarily wants, but the needs, and carry those forward, put those in our model, in our model and see what it looks like. And at that point, we may have to come back to you and say, these are, this is what we found in we either face pushing certain ones out, certain projects out, or if there's not something that can be pushed out, we talk about what the alternatives are then. Or we may be pleasantly surprised and staff has done such a good work, there's more money on revenues than there is going out. That would be great. <laughs> this brings up my question, just this curiosity. <laughs> on average, how, how well are you guys doing on estimating this? Like actual cost to what you estimate is you're you finding you're a little higher a little lower 50 50 or we, I don't I don't know that we've actually tracked it that closely yeah. what I will say is on some it's a little give and take on some projects we you know we can point to projects that we've cut the cost in half mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. simply we we didn't truly really cut the cost of the project what ended up happening is as we get closer to that project you know Pete starts doing research, we start doing research, and we find that we can actually change the scope of the project, which reduces the overall cost. 
-hmm. Unfortunately, costs are going to continue to go up, but it's continually refining the estimates and the scopes so that you know as they go up, we truly reflect reflect what we expect that project to be. But I don't know that we've actually done where you can say you have an average of. No, we've not. We've not done any hard tracking. Um, I'd say we we you know we once we get it designed um, and we know what the nuts and bolts, how many elbows, so on and so forth, we're pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, does everything go perfect? No, because nine times out of ten, what we find is there's some unforeseen condition that's going to add a little bit of cost to the project, uh, such as you know extra bad dirt that we want to expect, and, uh, you know, something like that. Well, just yeah. to kind of give you a, a bigger picture, once the once the, this is approved with the budget every year, whatever's in the bid, build year, whatever money we have, is set aside in a project fund. And as we go through the design process, if we go in through the design and we get the 90% opinion of cost, and if that cost is under our available budget, staff is authorized to go ahead and advertise the project. If the project comes in and it's within that budget and it doesn't require us to go to council, then we present it to the manager for approval. In our, and so the numbers you see here is exactly what's get approved gets approved by by council. If it's a formal project, meaning it's over five hundred thousand dollars, that requires us to go to council for approval. And in that case, if we need more money, then we present it at the same time with council. So they're seeing that we did exceed the available budget, and we normally or we are normally asking for contingency at that point that we have. Um, we needed a little bit more contingency in the off chains that we might need it. But we have we have finished projects where we have an available balance left. The project gets closed out and the balance goes back to the funding source. In this case, it would be the water and sewer fund. How does that work with bonds? I'm, I'm, maybe everybody else knows. I'm just curious. Suppose you go out for a $20 million bond and your project comes in $18 million. What's the, I mean, you still get the money for the bond, the extra yes. two me to apply it somewhere else? You can use it so on So the bond is set when you when you go for it? Yes. Okay. And you can use it on eligible projects. Right. Okay. I think I, I think I remember from the last go round, we had to have 70% of mm -hmm. the projects uh, either bid or awarded <clears throat> before we could uh, go for the bond. So if we had a list of projects, mm -hmm. only a minor amount of those could be ones that we haven't, we hadn't didn't have under contract and then so, there was a time frame that had to be under contract within a certain time frame okay. thank you question for you the only two priorities you're using are committed to and high priority so how are you really prioritizing stuff <laughs> the, most of the time it comes from uh, we'll go back and look at our work order history mm -hmm. if we spend a lot of time in, in on a particular street where we have a lot of repairs um, we'll we'll look at that and say yeah it probably needs to be looked at more so than one when we've only had one or two repairs where versus going to a particular street or something five or six times a year or more um, it and I think too that <coughs> in in this particular case with water and sewer they tend to all be high because you know either you're not gonna have water or you're gonna have you know a sewer spill but it might not be such a high priority if it was in another one of our areas, installing sidewalks, streets, playground equipment. So what's the difference between committed to and high priority? Is it because they're either externally mandated or it's part of an ongoing project? I think that the committed to was when we actually have money invested in the project. Already. Already. Yes. Okay. And so a high it's a continuation. priority. Correct. Okay. There's a couple in there that don't yeah, they fit that, yeah. They don't fit that definition. Yeah. They, then we need to identify those. Yeah. It would be helpful, and this has been suggested in past years, that just for the board, if you would take what's in the CIP for the water and sewer and prioritize them in a linear list, so we can see what you really think is like, don't mess with this at all because the world will come to an end to, we're doing this because this is the right time. You might have a bunch of ones. <laughs> well, and I think, that, I think that's the, the question that comes up when everything is high priority or committed, which committed is high priority. I mean, you, you're saying that it's got to be done because it basically because you pretty much do the same to all of them it makes it basically a useless grading system well I, and i will say that just because something says that it's a committed to doesn't necessarily mean that we are or have to move forward with that project 
And I'll give you an example, the Parkwood Regional Station. <coughs> By the time we get through the environmental documents and depending on what happens with the economy or it could be that we get there and, you know, council say we're not ready to move forward with that project. So just because it's committed to but doesn't you can't mean distinguish that, that in the at system. this point. Well, or any year. I mean that you you've used high, medium and committed in the past. Well, and there wasn't a way to say, well, gee, why is this other than you guys feel like it should be done? And they all are, are useful, needed projects. Although, but there's no sense of any priority because the only thing you're using is high priority or committed. Well, and you only get, I mean, we're limited what the software package will do. And I don't know how much weight is given to that priority. I think what she might be asking is <coughs> if you have 15 projects on here and you're told you only had money for 10 of them, which ones would you be picking? So, I mean, do some of them weight differently? That, that's where we go back to how others. much time we spend in that on each particular project area. If, if I spend, you know, three out of the 12 months on a particular street making repairs mm -hmm. and only one month out of the 12 on this other one, I'm going to say to Deanna, this one needs to go before this one because I spent more time there. That's more overtime. That's more O&M budget. That's but more asphalt of, repair. If all of them are listed as high, then we don't get that distinction of, well, then it comes back to then getting an explanation of, well, why is this high higher than that high? Are, you guys are aren't we, giving us any information because you're basically labeling them all the same. I would tell you that the advantage for you to convey that to us is then we can tell people why this is important to the extent that we understand better that if we don't service this pump station and even though it's not in our neighborhood if it fails it causes a major catastrophe our road may need to have something done to it, but this is a higher priority in another neighborhood and it would also give us it you know if we corner somebody like mr thomas and say hey we really like to see the, you know full support for the staff here instead of saying the whole thing because that's a significant amount of and again if all the money in the world is available i guess that's not an issue i would also point out when we we're talking about earlier your savings don't forget those times when you've switched projects from being revenue to the funds because that saved whatever the interest charges were and in the past they've not always been as low as they are now so that's another savings that you've come up with even though your CIP said it was going to be a lot more right when we can switch it to within the revenue source of the water sewer board it's in this case at least five percent cheaper so thank you any more questions y'all through okay Good job. Well, review the boards and committees November 19th meeting. You care to elaborate? Do you, do you want to elaborate or would you like me to? Yeah, uh, we had a, there was a joint meeting between all of the advisory committees um, and boards and commissions and council at the November 19th meeting. It was a pretty good discussion. We presented the work plan. Actually, Mr. Dorn presented the work plan. Um, for the upcoming year for that we talked about the last couple of meetings and that went over well there was it, two committees generated the most discussion um, it was us and the recreation committee um, and I guess the um, community development committee also did but our uh, discussion was focused primarily on I and I which this board talks about a lot <laughs> and on Greece which this board also talks about a lot in recognizing the importance of both of those issues. So all in all, it was a good conversation. We wish more could have made it to the, to the meeting, but maybe next year. Um, Mike Lazar, Con uh, Councilman Lazar was the one asking a lot of questions about the grease, the violation report. He wanted to know if yes. that was, which Wally told him it was a, a paper violation for most of them and not, you know, dumping anything in. And he asked, uh, 
about where the grease was coming from, I believe, in the, at the Northwood station, if it was businesses or housing, and of course, told them it was the housing areas over there that were doing it, not so much the businesses. Uh, one other thing, the mayor, at the end of the, uh, here it is, at the end of the presentation and all, he called out, where is that here? He called out all the members, and there was three of us, Wally, <laughs> Councilman Thomas and myself were the only ones that showed up. And comment was made about, you know, no other participants from the board were there. One board, I think, had, which one was it, the first one or something, had just right. about everybody there. The, com the community. What, is, and recreation. And recreation what was the first? Also. Recreation was first. Was that one? Okay, that one. They had had a pretty, well, the Environmental and Appearance Committee also had quite a few. But, you know, it would be advisable if, if there's any way possible somebody could appear. I thought Tom would be there, but you, the other Tom, <laughs> he's normally at them. But uh, I think we had a pretty, in the, in the council, in the uh, city manager was very pleased, I think, with all the boards and what they said. Anything last year we were very well represented. We were, we were one of the few last year who yeah. was representative. But I think it was because of the speaker for the Water and Sewer Board. That's <laughs> 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 my fan club. Mr. Henson, Henson here, uh, meeting schedule for 2014. One of the things that came out of <clears throat> the discussion at the boards and committee meetings is some of the other boards have gone to um, have actually changed their meeting schedule we actually have the opportunity now if we would like to consider that because the city's getting ready to make the calendar for next year for 2014 um, and send it out which has all the meetings um, printed on the calendar so the question is do we want to consider changing our meeting schedule what some of the other boards have gone to is an every other month full board meeting just like we have now currently we meet every month and then on the off months they actually have smaller <coughs> work group meetings um, and what that enables and those those aren't typically televised those are just so that the the work group can get with staff on a more on a smaller level and actually work through some of their tasks so the question is, you know, do we see an advantage to doing that? Would the board like to consider that for 2014? Um, some of the things that you have on your work plan, such as um, evaluating some of the operational components and making recommendations, might actually <laughs> lend themselves more to a smaller work group to where that work group could actually meet with staff and actually be involved in some of their operations and observe and, and basically learn more and then bring that back to the full committee. But I figured I would leave that up to the board, discuss it with the board, and, and see what you would like to do. What's the feeling of the board? What do you all think? I remember when we were meeting infrequently, and one of the things that the director said to us was, other than giving us presentations, we weren't aware enough to give meaningful input. I think that's changed with us meeting every month. I also think that on those occasions when we were very concerned about an issue, such as the rate increase and the uh, model that was being made, we met three times in special session out at the uh, fa uh, facility off uh, Marine Boulevard there. And I think uh, if we continue that, we will stay well enough informed to ask intelligent questions and give good recommendations. We could go to every two months, but I think uh, in some of the cases when something's presented one month and you don't meet for two more months to discuss it and then two more months before you can make a decision, you've just missed the boat on being able to give counsel or the staff meaningful input. So I, realizing that everybody can't be here all 12 months, but they make it as often as they can. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> what Tom says, but like we've got budget stuff coming up that we like to get involved in that sometimes we haven't been. 
and you can't do that every two months. Mm -hmm. you, that has to be a monthly thing. So, you know, come when we start budget, looking at budget, March, April. Mm -hmm. We'll start in probably the February, you know, and, March. And, um, time frame. Whether we're going to change any rates or anything has to be, you know, and you can't do it in two months. It's got to be. I can say something and I'll pass the gavel. <laughs> two months, every two months don't work. I've been on yeah, this board 30 so. years. We've tried a few times and it does not work. It gets so piled up, nobody knows what's going on, what they're talking about, or anything else, meeting every other month. But every month it seems to be working out real good now. I mean, <clears throat> we're moving good. Why, why, why mess it up? You know? Well, that just yeah. means that uh, I didn't. Again, I, I don't have a problem with monthly, but that, that means that if, as you're moving forward, you may have at least a smaller group of committee members that are going to have to commit more time. Well, when you need that, That's fine. come to the meeting, hey, I need three guys to come and get a good look, and I'll appoint three volunteers. Or some of us will volunteer, too. Yeah. So. You're going to do it. You're, you're, you're going to do it. You're some of us send you emails. Will, if you need somebody, you want somebody to go, you know. There, all of us can't do that. I mean, some got jobs that can't leave, and usually you got to leave when things are going not too good, you know what I mean? <laughs> too busy or whatever. Any other discussion? No, I just think it's important that we do a work group like he's talking about. I learned more going out and seeing these guys do their job than I do sitting in this meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm not criticizing the meeting but when you see what they do you understand the problem better and I've understood a lot better by going out and seeing them so I do think you need to at least somehow put a, the work group in there somehow I get a subcommittee yeah. <clears throat> to meet public staff like you said some work some kind of plan like that get some volunteers that I'm not going to point these volunteers have some volunteers that would like to go and Maybe like a week or two before this, or whenever you think you need to call them in for a particular reason or something. Well, most likely in January, we'll have the CIP um, more refined and have a pretty detailed discussion on, and hopefully have something that you can support carrying forward to council. And also on that meeting, we had planned to talk about one of your items for this year's work plan was starting to look at the operational, you know, and make some operational recommendations, and that's where I could really see a value of a smaller committee. Mm -hmm. We can appoint so, a subcommittee. So we'll we'll start talking about that next meeting. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion about the meeting. Want to keep it once a month, or give yes. us a motion as we make it legal. I make a motion that we keep our meetings at once a month and important subcommittees as needed. I second. second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. You got anything else, Paul? Yes, sir. Can I aye. say something? Can Excuse we have, me. I'm sorry, can yeah. we have um, a final, a copy of the final work plan that you all presented? Can everybody get a copy for the next meeting? Sure. Take care of that. Take care of that. You want a cross out version? Yeah. No, I well, want a here, one we can here, keep. You can look at it. I get copies, man. Okay, thank you. We'll get you a clean copy. Okay. Because that actually has the talking points on it, too, so it was. You can't do that. It's not on the Jim, agenda. Jim's marked it off. Okay, Brian. Good evening, board. Um, <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> As many of you know, uh, we've had some issues with our programming uh, the past couple months. Um, what you're going to see tonight is just for November only. Um, we could not pull the data for the past three months uh, for the restaurant violations and stuff. So what you're seeing tonight is November, November's uh, violations only. So in other words, they didn't turn in their grease trap receipt for October. We built out on November. That's what went out last month. Uh, we had 23 paperwork violations. Uh, we didn't have any pumping violations or any other violations. Um, all of them complied once they got one of the nasty grams that were sent out. And uh, we conducted 29 inspections last month as well, too. So even though that sounds like a high number, of course, you know, they got by for a couple months and now we're back on them. So. 
uh, we're doing pretty good now. So, um, to continue with my grease report tonight, um, I was tasked probably about a month ago uh, by my superiors to look at ways, uh, and, and I know the board talks about a lot of grease in here. Um, we, we've seen a lot of pictures of grease, uh, but I was tasked by my superiors to come up with a ways to help reduce grease in the lift stations. Um, so what we did was a pilot program uh, for the past month. And uh, on your screen, on the screen, you'll see what is Pine Valley Lift Station. Uh, this, this buildup of grease happens every week, every single week. Uh, you'll see on the walls, the grease line on the walls, around the guide rails. And what's bad is the float's actually right on top of it creating high alarms for us. So our jet truck actually goes every Thursday, sometimes twice a week, to bump out this. Now what does that involve? It involves four crew members, it involves a maintenance truck, the jet truck, um, it involves disposal fees, um, hauling fees out to the landfield, I mean it involves a lot of different variables. So what we did was Next slide. Uh, here's another picture. Um, as you can see, both of the pumps underneath there, and this is uh, where the floats were riding up on top of the grease. And, th and this is primarily residential? Yeah. Uh, yes, this is residential. This is all residential, so. How deep is this? Uh, that probably the, about 20. Yeah, the wet well is between 20 and 23 feet. Yeah. Depth. So this picture represents the the floats riding on top of the grease line. So what we did was we were approached by a company. Um, I do have a representative here tonight. Uh, we were approached by a company called Fog, Fog Free Technologies out of Charleston, South Carolina. And they had a system that eliminates grease, a chemical. So we've tried grease in the past, uh, grease solutions in the past for probably six or seven years now and uh, nothing has worked. I mean we've dumped every type of chemical in these wet wells. We've run this system for over a month. Uh, it in actually introduces a liquid that's run on a timer, uh, a foam liquid where it actually cakes the walls. Uh, the foam actually hits all the guide rails, hits the floats, and uh, while if you'll circle the, the nozzles there, uh, what it does is it rotates around and just sprays the whole wet well area. Uh, this picture was taken the day we started. The jet truck came, they sucked out the station, we pumped it down, got all the grease out of it. Thank you. This was taken this week. How many days elapsed? Mm -hmm. Four weeks, we have not been to pump out this station at all with our jet truck. So you can see the difference from the first picture where a week's buildup of grease. Do you spray it just once or does it intermittently spray it? Uh, it, it intermittently sprays it. It's set up on a timer okay. and it just depends on the dosage amount. Um, Basically, you can set it for every four hours, six hours, every five hours, and it'll come on for every 10 seconds, 30 seconds, minute, two minutes, however you want to set it. It's just got a chemical injection pump that it uh, produces the foam inside of it. D does it disperse it, emulsify it? Does it make it so it just gets Where's passed on go? to <laughs> the... And, and this is the point side. that I'm going to ask Marshall <laughs> Williams, who is the uh, Fog Free Technologies guy, to come up to the table. And uh, he can answer more questions on that end. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. I picture it better than that one. <laughs> uh, Fog Free is, uh, we've been around since 1991. Um, we are a specialty company that deals in wastewater problems. Uh, we are 100% organic, toxin free, biodegradable, caustic, plant based. 
we're listed on the EPA list as the only green oil dispersant. Nobody else has that. We have a patent on that. The way it works pretty much is uh, the good things about it, it's 100% organic. It uh, is it has no heavy metals, no bacteria, no enzymes, no phosphates. It's pH neutral. It organically transforms the fat insoluble. What it does is it puts the fat into a colloidal suspension and makes it water soluble. So it breaks down the grease. And as it's doing that, as it goes down the line from the lift station, it starts cleaning out your lines as well. Um, and the longer you use it, we found, the less you'll have to use. We've done this in uh, several counties. We do business in Berkeley County, uh, Orlando, DeKalb County in Georgia. And uh, on our website, if you go to Fog Free Technologies, you can go down on YouTube and see actual pictures in DeKalb County after six months, how it looked to start with and how it cleans. And after the six month period, you can see how clean it works. Um, it combines to, with the, the grease and puts it in a colloidal suspension so it will not come back together, ever. So as it goes down, it's not gonna come back somewhere and collect and harden back up. It won't, it won't allow it to happen. Uh, it, it's, uh, when it hits your lagoons, because it's pH neutral and it has no caustics, it enhances your lagoons to be able to eat, let the natural bugs eat your solids and stuff rather than putting something in there that's caustic that kills your lagoons and kills your good bacteria. What ours does is actually help the bacteria to eat it a lot faster. And we've proven that in several several cities and we can get your recommendations if you need it. But uh, that's four weeks and he hasn't pumped it. And uh, he has a cost, uh, Brian has a cost analysis of how, it, how it's costing. And, yeah, we're still in uh, the preliminary stages of that. So, but. But to answer your question, is there any getting down the line? Because this, this station pumps to Bryn Mawr. All right, Bryn Mawr is one of our big stations that generate a lot of grease. We're not seeing any increase in Bryn Mawr. Yeah, there's grease there now, but from four weeks ago till now, we're not, we're not seeing a big impact of grease down the line at all. Now, can you inject this anywhere in the system, or does it have to be the pumping station? You can inject it anywhere, but pump, pump stations are usually the yeah. best ones because they're force-fed or force, they usually force-pump something in most places, and they, they clean your lines out. So instead of going to, like, Henderson, we, look, we took a look at your Henderson station. Our technician's been doing this for a long time, and he said that's the worst one he's ever seen in his life. <laughs> he's been to Vietnam, he's been to Korea, he's been everywhere, and uh, it's a monster. We don't want to go to that and try to attack that right off the bat because we want our chemicals to be put into the other lift stations that will feed into it to decrease some of that grease problem before we just come in there and try and attack something like that. Um, so that's the best way to do it is take your, your problem lift stations, uh, inject them like that, let them flow and start cleaning out. And uh, as the problem gets better over time, then we can attack the, the rear of the monster. <laughs> Well, how long does it take for it to actually start taking effect once you well, do the foam? We put this in on November 20th, four weeks ago yesterday, and y'all haven't pumped it. They haven't been pumped out yet. It'll be pumped out, as I, I said. So the first week it started working. Yeah, I was saying, the reason I'm asking, yeah. can you inject it anywhere? Is it possible like we have grease getting to the pump station? Could it go like to a manhole somewhere and interject and clean those pipes down to that way? Yes, both sides yeah, of yes you can. Uh, we like for it to be where there's most turbulence because yeah. that's one of the things that you really need is to have turbulence. Uh, you does know, that help water, to break up? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a real key. I mean, if water's not moving. So you're not actually making the grease disappear. You're just breaking it up so tiny that it moves on and it finally is in the lagoon. That's, that's correct. Okay, but it keeps it out of the pump stations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see, uh, if, if you don't put anything in there, you saw in one week mm -hmm. what it looked yeah. like. Now, can you imagine what that would look like if he hadn't pumped it in the last month? It'd be overflowing. It'd be 10 foot deep in grease. <laughs> Did I understand you correctly that this pump station now should have uh, that at a less frequent rate, at a less frequent right, concentration right, now that it's... Right now we're using three gallons a day. We started at about 10 gallons a day to, to get it. I mean, it was a bad station. We ran it 10 gallons a day for about two weeks. We cut it back for the last two weeks. We've been using about three gallons a day. And it 
pump station in that size, your experience is how little do you have, can you drive it down to a gallon a day? Over a period of time, we may be able to get that, that one down to maybe two gallons a day. That's a big lift station. Uh, smaller ones uh, that aren't, aren't as big in circumference like maybe cottage, uh, we could probably use less, but it, we'll use more to start with. All of them are going to use more to start with, and then as it starts getting grease under control, we can dial it back. Um, it's best to have y'all come in and pump them out clean, and then us come in and inject it rather than do it the other way. What's the average cost per station? For installation? For installation. Oh, we don't charge installation. Um, there's no installation cost, there's no equipment fee uh, for this. Uh, equipment. All, we, all the city would pay for it so is you, just. All you, is buy the all you are paying for is the product. The we product. supply the equipment, we supply the, the everything, the contract. We don't <clears> come here and say, what's well, going to cost $5,000 to put this in. Uh, we, put this, we put the equipment in absolutely free. Um, Y'all pay, pay for the chemicals. And what's the charge for the chemical per gallon? Twenty-one dollars a gallon. It's it's part of the. Uh, like Brian said, we're still in the in the process of doing a cost benefit analysis. Yeah. Um, obviously, it works, and and I'll I'll tell you straight up. I told Marshall when he first came into my office, I'm a show me person. <laughs> I've told everybody that if they want me to buy their product, they need to show me, and this is the first product that I've seen that works. Um, I, I'm I'm supportive of it. However, the the cost has to factor in there too. I mean, this is something that we didn't budget for this year. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it works. Uh, when we get done with the cost benefit analysis, uh, we'll Brian and I get together with Mr. Hansen and we'll look at it and say, okay, um, you know, I'm ready to take it to city manager's office. Say, yeah, I want to include this in our new budget and and maybe get some funding for it. Um, we have to remember. I have 45 lift stations. We have 45 lift stations. See, and and yeah. it's not going to be good business sense to make, put it at every station, but if we do go down this road, we can put it upstream of the major stations and and essentially not just be treating one station, but as, as Marshall said, as it goes down the line, you're going to be treating other stations as well and, and work at it from, take it take that approach. Start at your outreaching and make it, let it work to your regional lift stations. Right and then minimize the amount you have at your regional stations and then in theory less at the main pump station and less at the grip chambers at LTS in theory and if it if we're successful thank you I'm not opposed to looking at it at the the uh, the grip chambers at the lift at the LTS that's pretty huge how long do you propose to uh, to uh, watch it to see just how long it will work the, the pilot study is over. It, it, it's over now. I beg your pardon? It's, this study that we've done is, is done. How long? A month. It went for a month, and then we'll, we'll watch the station, see how long it takes for the grease to build back up, and that'll give us a gauge. They check the station every day, and they'll tell us, well, they'll know when it's time so to pump it back up. You've been watching it for a month? Yes, sir. So I think you said November 20th? Never, I've been over every day. You November know, 20th tight, is how how the first day. We doubt it back. So. so from November 20th to, to, to December 12th, and then we'll watch it from now to see how long it takes for those grease ledges to build back up. We know what it did in the past. <coughs> but remember, if we're not putting this chemical in, it's going to build back up. Because it it's not going to stay in that wet well. It's going to cycle out. Go back to those. To we those have 45 lift stations, correct? Yes. No, how no, many no. do you visit weekly is, to take the one week. uh, grease out? So you, you said that four, one you visit Multiply that times week. four without any chemical. Um, how many stations do we degrease on a weekly basis? Well, you said you had one that you visit every week. Pine Valley. That's this one. Okay. There's, uh, yeah, there's the seven other seven. 44. I think there's seven. So that's your question. Seven of them that we try to go once a week. <clears throat> that degrease uh, runs out or disappears or whatever it does, does it go to the next station and clean that one? Well, the yeah, the one chemical one. will clean the next station or help reduce it. Right. Uh, is what the chemical is designed to do. It's not like it's going to just take all this degrease out of this station and transfer it to the next one. It goes down, it'll pull oh, you down the line to the next station. So you're in, okay. you're well, in the process of doing the cost benefit of analysis of your worst stations because you've, since you've already have man hours involved and pump trucks involved and having to clean them out right. versus what happens if you switch it over to using the chemical approach. Right. Okay. And, and it's and it's going to be we we may not even have the numbers to bring back to you in January's meeting. It's it's one of those deals where 
Uh, we know what the chemical feed rate is at this one, but if we go to another station, we have to, you know, we'll have to do an entirely different calculation for that station based on the size, the quantities, the feed rate, the cycling rate of the wet well, and all those will have to factor in, and then, you know, to have a true number for each station. Mm -hmm. I could tell you this station, you know, theory, you know, just pick a number ten thousand dollars a year, but that may not work for uh, Carolina Forest or Barris or. Northside or Commons because they're different size, different cycle rates. So it may be a different amount of chemical feed that has to go in. What does it cost you when you have to pump the mouth? With our trucks? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Once a week? Once a, we, can, that we can put together the cost pretty easy. The other piece that we need to keep in mind and, you know, Part of this is new. We've just well, tried it, mm -hmm. but it emulsifies the grease. It moves it down. Right. But it, we're not a typical treatment facility yeah, either. Because the land we're spraying. Yeah. It, right. So uh. there's also going to be some questions about what does the grease do right. to the soil? Exactly. Like, mm -hmm. So it's more than just a straight cost benefit right. analysis. That's why it's not. You know, we can put together a cost benefit analysis pretty quickly, but it's, it's going to be more than just. A true cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Grease is really nasty and on soil, so you want to find out what's actually being discharged. And it may be pH neutral when it hits the lagoons, but there's still at some point. Yeah, what happens? So, it's going to affect land application. Well, and that's well, part of the bigger question. Yeah, that's so, it, extended air system it may be, in a river. It, it may no deal. be a great solution. We just we need to get there. Well, have they that, tried this on any? Yeah, uh, exactly. What do they call them? Uh, LP, LPP. low pressure drain fields like at the beach, or <coughs> yes, how, is it, how is it affecting the it, it's, drainage? It's, it's helping. Um, our product is, is, is designed just for that. Uh, we do a lot of beaches in, in, in Florida uh, that are real sandy areas that are close to the beach and to the water where you know where that's a big concern. They've had no problems with that. Uh, Every you know every lift station is different. Everyone's different yeah. size. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to take a different amount. Everyone's going you know. I mean, you can't just go and say this. This doesn't fit the mold for every one of them. But but has it been done on another system that's still <coughs> a land application system or septic system type land dispersal? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Berkeley, Berkeley County is doing it right now outside Charleston. Okay. And, and part of our big picture looking at this, we will get with, with Marshall and, and either do some field trips or get some references and, and do some extensive research to say, uh, is it, you know, is it doing, not that I'm doubting yeah. Marshall, I mean, his product, we've seen it work, but look in the big picture, we're going to do it, and if we do it, we're going to find out, you know, what other people say. Yeah. And his customers are going to tell, tell the truth. All right, the thing, something that crosses my mind is that there is no way that you can drive grease in the system to zero. No matter how much education, money we put into education, things we hand out to the public, such as the cans and the caps and all that. So you're always going to have grease in the system. That's correct. And it, I guess at, from what you're telling me, it's not... If you put all that money into education and handouts and freebies, and you still have grease, then it's not a matter of the, is it going to be a straight cost in that he doesn't have a truck going out there to empty it as much as it's, this may be a solution to something that you can never drive to zero. And the only real question then becomes, is there going to be a camera question on the grease application uh, on the soil? Well, is there a long-term effect or, and those, those are, Again, we need more information, mm -hmm. and it, but it's, you know, as far as cost, the cost is pretty effective from what Pete's gathered. Well, but again, we, just we don't have an sure alternative. Long -term, that's right. We don't have an alternative where you can make the public so well educated that there is no grease in the sewer system. I mean, we can always want to get it reduced, it's that's right. but you can't <laughs> make it zero. That's right. We, we can remediate hydraulic fluid. Jet fluid, diesel, number six diesel. We've done it for the government on Navy bases. Uh, I mean, they're amazed. We, it's a truly unique product. You won't find anything else out there like it. The other thing too is it has to be saving you not just in the pumping, 
But if the system works, doesn't it save you just on the wear and tear and the problems with those pump stations? Yeah. And then if at some point it turns out that it can't be used on land application, can it all be collected at the lagoons, which would be a much more economical way yeah. of doing it than doing it on the lagoons? Some of our solutions, we even uh, remediate PCBs as little as 24 mm -hmm. hours. Mm. It's proven. I mean, I we've suspect got it all documented. Once it gets to the lagoon, thing. as he's described it, you're not going to be able to coagulate. It's so dispersed. You, yeah, it, the way that these chemicals are working, you're not going to be able to coagulate it to take it out. It's only going to be like through a natural filtering system, like a, you know, the Earth mm -hmm. Nano system. Mm -hmm. well, what do you mean? It's going to be in the system forever? No, the bacteria eats it. Huh? The bacteria eats it at the lagoon. And it acts as a surfactant as it travels down the. And everything that eats the excretes to the anaerobic going out into it. Does that work in an anaerobic, anaerobic system? Yes, sir. Both yeah. Need to buy some of your place. Mm -hmm. Well, let us know. Okay. Any other questions? No, I'm done. I'd just like to commend the staff for looking and doing this because we've had a lot of discussion on the past and we've always tried to say, hey, get to restaurants, then get to residents. And the lift stations were always a question. And this is, seems to be a much better solution than putting another $100,000 in education. Yeah, it's like Pete said, we've seen a lot of products <laughs> come and go. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, the plant goes bad, dump it, put dog food in yeast and extend it airplane, boy, she'll come right back. But well, the chemicals yeah. that they gave you don't work. I, again, I'd like to commend I mean, the staff for mm -hmm. You know, that's a great one. If I save a lot of time and trouble having to dip the nets. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been privy to look at some of the figures, the cost estimates, and I'm telling you, it is a savings. Mm -hmm based on just what they I saw and that wasn't even you know getting down to the nitty-gritty so it does look like it would save money so yeah we'll be interested in seeing it when you yep. bring it back to us yep. definitely carry on old business I, I don't know if it counts as old business or not it was got brought up at the last meeting. Thank you for giving us the handout. Because I'm sure somewhere in here, since you gave it the handout at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to touch upon it somewhere. Oh, no, it, it's, <laughs> it's, that's me. I was going to cover it under new business. But, okay, uh, whichever whatever, way. Whatever the board's preference is. You oh, fine? Oh. No, sir. Okay, okay. good. I'm leaving. I'm going to leave another one of these on the back. You'll see the Fog Free Technologies website. You can go there and click on the YouTube, and you'll actually see the video that we did at DeKalb County. How it works is it goes down and it's in a lap six month time and it'll show you just how clean it gets. Okay, thank you. Y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank thank you. Okay. Since this is on the new business, we're gonna the new business, then we'll come back to old business. Alrighty. Um well um under under this um the question was asked last last month and we're not ready to fully address it. Um but what I did was put together some figures um, as far back as 2008 uh, just to somewhat try to track um, the, the amount of water we're producing into the distribution system, the amount of effluent we're receiving at the LTS, and somewhere in between there is the amount that is billed through our meter billing system. And as, as you all know, numbers can be manipulated any way you want them to be. When Brian and I sat down to figure this out, we said, what would be a good number for us to say water that goes through the meter is returned to the sewer system? And, and you know, you can be anywhere from 80 to 100% of it comes back. But we used the number 95% is what we felt comfortable saying is returned to the sewer system other than from cooking and evaporation, your ice makers, your, you know, your plus or minus stuff where you're going to lose a little bit of your water. So we used the number 95%. And what you'll see is um, all the way out in column I is the um, percentage of, of what we determined using the 95% to be the amount of I and I we received each month. And I will tell you for the month, the years of 2008, 9, and 10, don't put a lot of credence into those numbers because there were some issues with the amount billed. Um, so those numbers are kind of a little bit skewed if you look at them. I mean, we don't build eight million gallons of water a month. It's a whole lot higher than that. And some of those numbers are skewed. But those are the numbers I was given. And 
I've always been a firm believer to give you honest what I get, put it in the report, so that's what I got, so that's why I put it in there. But if you look for years uh, 2011, 12, and, and through October of 2013, you'll see that we've been fairly consistent with our percentage of INI. &I. It's, it's hovering around the 30%. I, I believe it was Ms. Ayuso who asked me after the meeting last, last month, um, were we able to tell a difference in the amount of INI &I rehab work that we've done based on the I and I percentages and my answer was no but you don't use that as a gauge if you look at the number of reportable sewer spills we've had as a result of rainfall that number has drastically reduced as a result of our I and I rehab in 2009 when I came we had 14 reportable spills the majority of those were because of, of rainfall events this year we've had four of those four I think two, one or two were rainfall events, the other were because of some type of blockage. So the I and I work, Greg's work, I mean he's, he was way on this before I got here, it's working. You may not see it in the percentage of I and I, but if you look at the, what, what's valued more is the number of reportable sewer spills we have is drastically reduced. The, the, the overtime that we're incurring has reduced because of having to monitor these stations. We've got better accountability, we've got better monitoring, and we actually know more about what's going on with our system now. And this is just some, some numbers I wanted to put with you. And again, we're not, we're not done with this. Uh, uh, Dr. Rashas had asked what the cost to treat this was. We're not ready to go down that road yet because there's just too many variables. You know, how do you want to peel the grape? You know, are we okay using the 95% return to the sewer system? Do you want to go with 90%? You want to go higher? You know, so there's so many variables in there, and quite honestly, we've all been so busy, we just haven't had a chance to sit down with Mr. Hansen yet and say, okay, how do you want to peel this grape? 95% would be a lot more conservative than, say, 90%. Correct. Um, my only thought is looking at, you know, the summer months, especially our drier summer months, a lot of times people start doing more irrigation type things or running mm -hmm. sprinklers for kids or doing other activities, in right. which case you know, it, it, it probably at least doubles that to sure. you know, 10% instead of 5%. But, and, and, um, that's, and those are some of the variables that we have to figure in before we bring you truly what we feel are honest numbers. But even at the 95% where you're saying all but 5% is returned as being a very conservative number for 2013, for example, just so far this year where you have 10 months of the year listed, that's over 450 million gallons of water, mm -hmm. which is a heap of water. Right. Now, that, that, that number is directly related to the 95% return. Uh, the, the gallons difference is um, column E, which is the influent received at LTS based off their flow meter, and the, the estimated 95% return. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the variable in there. Uh, that number, you know, I can make it look astonishing or I can make it look like holy crap what's going on um, but again it's you know where do we feel comfortable what number do we feel comfortable with and so that's why we we had chose the 95 percent yes that is a conservative number so if that's a good number anything else from that is is a whole lot right. less good yeah to put and, it mildly you know and, and again you could compare that the different the influence to the to the amount pumped that's going to change your number drastically too so it's all in how you want to view this data as to, you know, what numbers do we want to present? I, I've given you all the numbers, and the numbers that we used to come up with it was the 95% return to the system, and the difference between that and what influent was registered on the flow meter at LTS. That number we know is good. We know that's an accurate number coming off the flow meter. We know the gallons billed is, is probably 99% accurate. And we know the gallons pumped, column B, that came straight off the meters at the well houses and the water plant. So we know those numbers are accurate. It's, it's that one column, column D, that's going to make the difference. Pete, is there an industry standard for INI? Uh, <coughs> I, I ask that with the knowledge that uh, in the dark ages, when I took civil engineering, there was, but I don't know if they are still using stuff from clay pipes. And I, I would say, for me, my standard, 
would be anything less than 10% would be acceptable. Okay. So we would That's like to look standard. at 10%. And that would be my, I don't know if Greg has, I mean, Greg is our senior civil engineer. He's much smarter than I am, so. And, and right now we're at <laughs> 30%. Yes, right, yeah, right now we're averaging around 30%. Realizing that you'd like to be at 10% and using the markers that we have, which you may refine here as we go, I notice on the CIP that your engineering design uh, is every other year and is at $65,000. Is that a hindrance to making more progress on the INI, or is that a uh, you just don't know any better that what would be useful uh, in that effort to improve your INI? What what, uh, what we general what we targeting is spending is our guideline is to try on a rolling five-year average to spend about 2.2 to 2.5 million towards our INI effort. And so if you look at the, uh, the uh, current CIP, it locks out five years. Mm -hmm. And what you've got in your packet, that's about what we're spending. This last go-round, we've got a project, on, having said that, we've got a project underway right now that we uh, went out and started targeting the areas that we thought we needed to do some, some work. We went out and smoke tested, did some observation, uh, and we're spending, I think, about $1 million dollars and we have stuff left on the table that we're not able to get to so that's going to be in our next effort I guess the question I have is you said you had a 2.5 million over five years is that a number that was based on something or just what you thought would be approved or that was I, I guess guidance in past budget years for CIP that, that this is what we should target so that's what we've been trying to stay around would the support of the board for a larger engineering design effort every other year be helpful or do you think you're about right with what you're getting there? I, I'm just thinking that the influence that the board had on Greece, i.e. talking about it all the time, if we brought that type of influence and then suggested to the CIP up to the council that I and I could be a significant return on investment. It could be. Uh, yeah. But what, what would be the number that would be, I mean, you can always get more money you can spend than you spend it foolishly, or you can have not enough money and not be able to accomplish something. Top of my head, um, all I can do is give you an example right now. I've got, I think, one point one $1.2 million maybe to spend towards construction. We've identified uh, through our work, of, I think, something on the order of $1.5, $1.7 million if we have more money we can go back right now. So you saw that in our CIP, that what we do is we, is we, you know, we put so much money in every couple of years towards construction. So we're going to pick that up in fiscal year after this coming, based upon our schedule right now. And at the same time, you know, while we're doing capital projects, I don't even count what Pete's out there doing. I mean, he's finding even more stuff, and he's attacking it through his his operational budget. I mean, you know, he said, gave me a nice compliment a minute ago, but he's the guy that went out uh, here very recently and found a uh, sewer pipe running through, I guess, a stormwater box and uh, fixed it, and now we have a manhole that doesn't overflow anymore. So. It's a team effort. I, I, I'm assuming that if we get ahead of this, then the cost will go to an, a, a lesser amount because right now we're trying to fix things we've not been maintaining. Yes, you're, you're always going to have to attack it. I mean, it's, it's, it's always going to be an ongoing battle. But yes, I think, you know, when I got here, um, I got here during the construction phase of our first ever INI project. The city had never done an INI project before. And that was, the, I mean, and so this is the, this will be the, I think the third, we're working on the third effort right now. And we spent, I don't know, we spent about a million dollars a pop each time. Question, because I think that uh, <coughs> one of the lines near Triangle was brought up as being mm -hmm. an I and I area that you were saying that it was private, mm -hmm. so that it was either they were going to fix it or you were going to fix it and build them. What's the status on that? I went in there and did as many of the uh, cherry picking repairs as we could, or my staff did. Uh, 
my, my argument has always been it's much cheaper for me to go put a dollar fifty clean out cap in than it is to try to fight with somebody to go do it. Mm -hmm. So I sent my guy in there and said, go fix every clean out cap you can fix. And so he's fixed everything on the surface that can be fixed. Um, we are still, we had some other areas we had to pull off of for the cameraing and jetting to go take care of. Part of it was for the CIP stuff because it was critical information needed. As, De as Deanna told you, because our projects are always evolving. So we had to take care of that. So I had to pull them off of the of cameraing and jetting that line to find defects there, but I will put them back on it. But for right now, we fixed all the cherry picking, low hanging fruit that we could. And it has made some difference. Um, but smoking catch basins, we can't fix. And, and that's the other thing. I and I has the double benefit of one, it keeps excess water from going to the treatment plant to be land applied, but it also helps restore some capacity yes. and helps prevent some of the overflows. So it's got that double benefit to it, if it can make things last longer. Especially with the concern of okay, going from 18, 8 inch pipes to 12 inch pipes or 16 inch pipes to 24 inch pipes and yeah, conservation of space. You do this. I um, was new business. One more thing, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, no. it's, it's not pertaining to... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Um, next Thursday, December the 19th, we are hosting, I'm hosting our annual Christmas celebration, and I would like to extend an invitation to all the board members who'd like to come. It's, it'll be, we'll be eating around noon, um, as we did last year. We'll, we're cooking a pig, and we'll have some ham and some, some potluck stuff, but you're all invited to attend. Um, it is funded primarily by me and some of the staff members, um, so the, you know, no city funds are expended because um, it is a very bad budget year. What day? Um, 19th, 19th, next 19th. Thursday. What, to 12? Around 12. Yeah, you're more welcome to come early and stay. Um, there will be plenty of people there, um, plenty of food. So you're all more than welcome to come and uh, you know, bring some of your family members if you like. Where did you stay? At my shop at the Public Service Complex in Building B. But I just want to extend that invitation to all the board members and Councilman Thomas. That's it for me, sir. Yeah, that was new business, and now we're going to old business. I got new business. <laughs> You're too late. <laughs> yeah, okay, I got man. a party to get. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> On Wassa, advisory yeah, board did not meet. It will be meeting, should be meeting, in January. The planning board, nothing that had anything to do with us here. They just had a uh, Parker and Associates out there at Hunters Creek. They asked for a one-year extension to get into the project they're doing, and they're putting in a road now out there behind off Piney Green, and they have on Watson Water and Sewer will be working at. And after a year, they've had two years, now they're on a year extension to get it built. After that, they'll have to go to council to get approval if they need it anymore. That was the only thing. I have a question. Where's the road going? That's to build us an aerial crosswalk. Uh, Hunters Creek off of uh, Piney Green. Well, I'm talking about off 24. They're putting the road in there. Are they going to connect? Yeah, the road's going, there's going to be two roads. One's coming off of Piney Green. There was a McDowell's, was it? I think it is. Trailer Park or something was in there. It's going back in through the back of that, and then there's going to be another one coming out there on 24. So that's probably the one. Are they working on one 24 yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, they're working on them now. Just the roads, but they haven't started. Oh, but they all going to connect with one of them. Yeah, it's going. One's going in one side, and one's going in part of the other. I don't think they'll connect. Hmm? I don't no, the two they're roads not. aren't connecting. They're co connecting on a piece of property. They're going to be just another way. In other words, if I want, I don't have to leave 24 <laughs> to go all the way up and around and come back down on, on Piney Green to get back in there. No, but there's going to be, <clears throat> they haven't quite decided how it's going to be because they're, you know, expanding the road, but there's going to be, they said something about you were going to, Mr. Parker, that you're going to have to come down and make a U-turn and go back up in order to get where you, because you, you're, when you come out of the road there on Piney Green, you're not going to be able to make a, Left, left turn, you're going to have to make a right turn going towards 24 and then go down the next cut through and cut around and go back if you want to go towards 17. I missed something. What's the purpose of the road? That's <laughs> 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 the developer and all that's doing that. Uh, DOT. Right. Right. It's just, <laughs> you don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Before we adjourn, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year.
do well and prosper. See you back in January. What do you Christmas a motion presents? to adjourn. What? You have our Christmas present? <laughs> Here. <laughs> we have a motion to adjourn. A motion we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. See you in January.